I'm a fellow East Valley person. My wife and I live at Greenfield and Southern, so it's good to be in, your, in our neighborhood together this morning, worshiping the Lord, taking communion with one another, and I'm just thrilled to see what God is doing in this church uh, through you and through the ministry of John. It's great to see a pastor so devoted to Christ and his word, preaches faithfully, and, uh, and, and just loves, loves people. Um, I, I, as he, John said, I'm teach at Phoenix Seminary. I've been there for four years, and I'm allowed to give just a brief infomercial, so indulge me that. Uh, Phoenix Seminary, we are a, a conservative, orthodox, theological seminary where we get the opportunity to train people for ministry. If you feel like God is calling you into ministry, don't go untrained, but take some time, invest that time, and come and learn the Word of God, and, and then let, let uh, let your church send you out to, to do that ministry. It's a real privilege to get to do what I get to do, and, and I, I love it. Okay, I want you this morning to imagine yourself adrift out on the ocean, no land in sight, dying of thirst. This is the exact situation that Salvador Alvarenga found himself in in 2012. He was on a fishing trip off the coast in the Pacific, uh, off Mexico, and it wasn't long before what was supposed to be a fun trip turned south and great waves swelled up and, and heavy winds and his little boat capsized, but he was able to get a little life raft off just in time uh, to save him. And there he was bobbing up and down in the Pacific Ocean for 438 days. It's reported that this is the longest anyone has ever spent adrift at sea and still lived. And he did it by catching fish and birds, and he would stay hydrated through drinking the blood of turtles. Now imagine that when his thirst set in, he looked around him and saw all the water, and he thought, I can hydrate myself here. I got plenty of water around me. And at first he begins to just cup his hands and lap up some of the water, and soon he plunges his head all the way in, and he just starts taking deep gulps of seawater. I think you know what would happen. Ironically, the water that should lead to life is the exact thing that would kill him. Our kidneys can't process that, that much salt. The, the, the salt pulls water actually from the cells, and pretty soon he would die of dehydration. The, the thing that should quench your thirst actually takes it away. I think the reality is it's the world that we're born into. We're thirsty, we're born dying of thirst, and we're surrounded by things that look like water, look like things that will give us life, and all they do is bring us death. I think Paul sets up a, a similar contrast here in Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Or I think he might have said it another way. Don't drink salt water, it leads to death but drink from the living water that the Holy Spirit provides. So I have one question for us this morning that I want you to be thinking about, and the question is simply this. What are you filled with? What are you filled with? I think Paul sets up the problem in the first part of this verse. Don't get drunk on wine. I think we'd all agree that many Christians are not living a spirit-filled life. And I think if we're really honest this morning, Many of us in this room would say, I'm not living a spirit-filled life. There are many, too many, who are content to live half-spirited life. We're surrounded by so much comfort in our world, and, and a lot of us just want enough of God, enough of the Spirit, that when we stand before Him in judgment, we're saved, we're into heaven, but we really want lives uh, under our direction, lives of comfort, lives of ease, here and now and maybe don't want to press into the things of the Spirit, we settle and would suck in salt water instead of drinking from the rivers of God's delights. A.W. Tozer was a pastor in the 20th century. Many of you may be familiar with him. He said it like this. We may as well face it. The whole level of spirituality among us is low. We have measured ourselves by ourselves until the incentive to seek higher plateaus in the things of the Spirit is all but gone. We've imitated the world, sought popular favor, manufactured delights to substitute for the joy of the Lord, and produced a cheap and synthetic power to substitute 
for the power of the Holy Ghost. I think what Tozer's really driving at in that is, is the spirit-filled life is a life of joy. And yet we substitute so many things for the life of, of joy. But joy is a universal reality. Every person who's ever lived on the face of the earth has been seeking joy, has been seeking satisfaction. Even if you remember your, your nursery books, Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore. Eeyore is this sad, dour donkey, and everything is always really bad. But even Eeyore is, is recognizing there's a better reality. There's something that should bring joy. All this is bad, but something out there should be satisfying and, and fulfilling. And the reality is there's real joy, and it's only found in Christ, and it's only accessed through the Spirit, but we manufacture it. Tozer suggested four things, and I want to mention them to you briefly. We imitate the world. The reason we cannot tell the difference between spirit-filled Christians and the lost so often is that Christians are lockstep with the world. Everything that your neighbors care about who don't love Jesus are the same things that we care about, and our lives look exactly like theirs, and then one day it comes to the point where we say, well, you need Jesus, and they say, why do I need Jesus? We're living the same life. I, I see no difference in the way you're living and the way... I'm living. Everything in this fallen creation, in the fallen heart, points in the opposite direction of God. So if we're in step with the world, we're out of step with God. We, we turn our gaze away from the Lord and onto the things of this world, and, and then we are confused when people don't see the difference between us. Or we've sought popular favor. To, to be spirit-filled is to be unpopular in the world. Popularity in the world is to be unpopular with God. To be in favor with the Lord is to be out of favor with the world. The New Testament says it so clearly. This is a day and age where standing up and sticking up for truth is very, very difficult. I know a lot of you probably lament the fact that when you think back on your childhood and the things that you were dealing with are very different than the things that our youth are dealing with today. And that makes me sound like a grumpy old man, and I don't think I am. But the, but the reality is... To stand up for truth in today's culture, to stand up for truth in the things that our, our kids are facing means to be called a bigot, a hater, intolerant, and even most ironic of all, unchristian. We need people who will stand against the tide of the world and, and be fine with being unpopular. Look, if you're young here, the hardest thing you're going to have to do if you want to be faithful to Christ is risk unpopularity. But to be in step with the Spirit is to be out of step with the world. It's the Spirit of truth, and he's calling us to truth. And, and we wonder so often, why, why is it that, that my life seems not spirit-filled? And, and then we, we recognize that the times the Spirit's prompting us and provoking us to say things, we find ourselves quiet. And this doesn't mean you become a troll on Facebook or a troll on Twitter, and you got to be the angry, vitriolic Christian shouting down everything. That's not what I mean at all. There will become times when just saying what is true will cost you, but it's worth it. And we've manufactured delights. I love how Tozer says this. We, we actually build things to try to fit that hole. I, I love that Pascal said there's a God-shaped hole in all of our hearts. And I think he's right, and it's true. And we do everything we can to kind of fit our life into that so that we'll, we'll be satisfied with things and maybe not with Christ. We, ma we manufacture all kinds of things. I, I just need a little bit more money to fit that hole, and then I'll be happy. I just need another promotion, then I'll be happy. If I got married, if I had kids, if I got divorced, then I'd be happy. Then I could live the spirit-filled life. And over and over and over, and what is it? It's drinking salt water. And we take in the salt water thinking this will satisfy, and it leaves you more thirsty, so you need more of these things. And I think... One of the ways we can tell that is, is how often we speak of blessings in re regard to material things. God has really blessed me, which means I have stuff. And I'm not saying that's not a blessing, but where are the people who are saying, I'm blessed, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. God's favor is in my life. And cheap substitutes. When it comes to spirit-filled living, it's amazing the substitutes that we will allow. I don't like substitutes in my life, especially cheap substitutes. Uh, I'll just be honest and a little bit vulnerable with you this morning. In high school, especially, I had a bit of an addiction. 
and it was Mountain Dew. I, I would drink it almost by the gallon, unfortunately. It was not, not good. It's like sipping salt water, I guess, in some ways. Um, and my dad would go to the store, and he, I think he would go to Sam's or, or Walmart or something, and get this nasty stuff called Mountain Lightning. It is one of the worst substitutes for anything I've ever had. Or you go to the restaurant and you say, do you have Mountain Dew? And they say, we have Mellow Yellow. That is not a substitute. Away from me, Satan, with your nasty drink. (laughs) If some of you work for Coca-Cola, maybe that gets me in trouble. I don't know. But it's true. I don't like substitutes. I don't want substitutes when it's something I really care about. And yet how often will we substitute things of this world to fit what only the Spirit of God can fill? We, we seek these substitutes. It, they're cheap. They don't fit. I, I love this, this quote from C.S. Lewis. Many of you are probably familiar with it. He said this. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. They're far too weak. The things that we seek are far too weak. God offers us this unbounded, unending joy, and we see that and we say, I I hear you, Lord, but these things would really satisfy my heart. If I had these, and we want our cake and eat it too, and we kind of want to live in both things, we we, we straddle the, the fence, and we wonder why we feel so little of the Lord's presence when we're drinking the salt water. It's interesting to me that Lewis points out drink and sex and ambition as substitutes for joy, because that's exactly what Paul says in our verse. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul's contrasting life with Christ and life in the Spirit. I'm sorry, drunkenness with, with Christ. And I think he uses drunkenness for two reasons. The first is that it's intoxicating. People want this intoxicating feeling, this sense of euphoria. And Paul's saying that's actually found in Christ. Christ is the one who should give us that type of... Of, of excitement and deep sense of satisfaction. Uh, one of my favorite figures in church history is Cyprian of Carthage. And when Cyprian spoke of the Lord's Supper, he called it a sober intoxication. Because you're taking the wine of the world that leads to so much drunkenness, and instead you're using it, and it brings you soberness of the world, but intoxication with God as you draw closer and closer to Jesus. So we need more sober intoxication. Alcohol cannot provide the same sense of of relief, of joy that that the Spirit does. But secondly, and I think even more importantly, it's the escape factor. People use alcohol as an escape from the challenges and the difficulties of life. And I want to give you a few things that are like alcohol. I think he just picks one because it could be substituted for so many different things that we use to give us happiness instead of Christ, and they're things we use as escapes from the real world. And these are a bit stereotypical, but it's the dad who comes home, and he's tired, and he just hits the couch, turns on the TV, and wants to escape. It's the mom who finds herself at Target day after day doing some retail therapy because things are hard, and they just want something that's an escape. Sometimes the escapes are not bad. Sometimes they are evil. Lives of drunkenness and drugs that give the illusion of a pain-free existence, but they cost you way more. Sin always costs way more. The price tag is never there. And when we find those things for satisfaction, we find ourselves too far gone sometimes. But with Christ, he can always bring us back. It's escape into sexual addiction and pornography that's everywhere today. And then there's things that aren't even that bad. And if I was guessing, in this room, most people, it's not some big-ticket, high-item sin that's distracting you from the Spirit and and is making you escape from the the harder things of life and not turning to the Spirit. It's things that are not really even that bad at all. I wonder if Paul was writing Ephesians 5.18 today, what might he say? I think he might say something like this. Do not binge on Netflix, for that leads to laziness, but be filled with the Spirit. 
Do not spend three hours sifting through social media, for that leads to comparison. Be filled with the Spirit. Do not spend your life trying to get ahead at work, for that leads to greed, but be filled with the Spirit. Do not turn to food for comfort, for that leads to gluttony. Be filled with the Spirit. And something I feel like I can say because I'm the guest preacher, and you can get mad at me. Do not so dote on your kids that you put all of your effort in this life into making them superstar athletes or whatever activity they're engaged in, but never teach them to be full of the Spirit. Rather, you be full of the Spirit and teach them to be full of the Spirit as well. We have a problem. We're addicted to things that distract us from the Spirit-filled life. They give us escape. But the world is just one big ocean of salt water, one big bucket of wine, and instead we need to be filled with the things of the Spirit no, nobody comes to the end of their life and, and says, I really wish I had more time in the bottle. I really wish I had spent more time on Instagram. I really wish I had spent more time in the batting cages. Even though all those things, again, they're not bad. But I think there's going to be so many people who recognize they're about to stand before the Lord and say, I wish I had spent more time walking with the Spirit. And the good news is God's a God of new mercies. Every day is new mercies. If you're in here today and you think, I'm not walking in step with the Spirit, today could be the day that turns around. Because Paul gives us the solution as well, not just the problem. And the solution is to be filled with the Spirit. The second half of the verse is clear. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. It is a command. Paul tells us to do that, which raises a couple questions. First, what does it mean to be full of the Spirit? And second, how do we become spirit-filled? The Bible speaks of two ways that we can be spirit-filled. There's the filling that comes with regeneration, which is just the big theological term meaning to be born again. So if you've been born again, you've been regenerated, which means you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The Bible also speaks of this seven times as baptism of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist, looking forward to Jesus, said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And I think that's controversial for a lot of people today. What does that mean? What are they talking about? I think in every instance in the New Testament, it means to be born again, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're not looking for a second baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit comes when you believe in Christ, turn from your sins, repent, and trust him for salvation, and then you're, you have the Holy Spirit who's baptized you. That's one way to speak of fullness. But the second way is the way I think Paul is meaning it here. And that means in our Christian life, there should be a sense in which we're living lives full of the Spirit. Oftentimes in the New Testament, it'll say this. And because Paul says, be full of the Spirit, that kind of tells me that we could be not full of the Spirit and be Christians. Like you could be here today and have like a three-quarter, a half tank, a quarter tank, or near empty in regard to how full of the Spirit you are. And I always just, I, I feel like a lot of Christians feel defeated. I feel like a lot of Christians might say, I'm feeling near empty. And the beautiful thing is Jesus says, I don't extinguish a smoldering wick. If you have faith in Christ and the Spirit's in you, God can take the empty to the full. And he loves to do it. The New Testament describes us full of the Spirit in several ways. Luke especially really likes the phrase. He says that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit when he went out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. G uh, Peter, rather, was full of the Holy Spirit when he stood before Caiaphas and the high priestly family to talk about Jesus. Uh, when, when he was released from prison in, in these beautiful stories of Acts, he goes back, meets with the disciples. They are praying fervently to God. The room shakes, and we read that all of them were full of the Holy Spirit. Luke tells us that Stephen was a man full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Luke really likes to pair these together, full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, as though they, they're almost like one and the same thing when he was called to be a deacon, and at the end of his life, as he's being stoned to death, he's described as one who's full of the Holy Spirit. Barnabas, also described as one full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And Paul is said to be full of the Holy Spirit when he confronts false teachers. When salvation comes to the Gentiles, they are said to be filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. That's just a sampling of how often the New Testament is saying, what does it mean to be full of the Holy Spirit? 
Notice how often it's because they're standing firm for God. They're preaching the gospel. They're witnessing for Christ. They're rebuking false teachers. They're needing boldness, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. But sometimes Luke just says, this is a person who's full of the Holy Spirit. You ever been around someone that you would just say, they are, they're oozing with the Spirit. They're full. They, their life seems saturated. It's usually somebody who you would say, if I can picture what Jesus would be like today, it's them. Remember, the Holy Spirit's the Spirit of Christ, and, and when the Holy Spirit's full in somebody, their life looks a whole lot like Jesus. And those are the people I just want to be like because they're so much like Jesus. And you see the Holy Spirit all over them, and I think that's how Luke is describing some of these people. But the reality is it's, it's almost, a, to quote Tozer again, it's almost an issue of possession, to be possessed by the, the Spirit in a way that he directs the steps, he directs the attitudes and the thoughts of the heart, deeper into Christ and deeper into love for others. We're talking about a full submission to, to the Spirit, a relinquishing of your life so the Spirit can live in and through us. And if we're honest, that makes us really uncomfortable. We want lives that we can kind of measure out. We want lives that, that make sense to us. But if, if I feel like if I give the keys over to the Holy Spirit, who knows? I might be on the next plane to Africa, and then I'm a missionary, and Lord, I don't really want to be a missionary. So if I had to be full of the Holy Spirit to do that, maybe I don't want to do that. And it shows us really that we lack trust in God. God, I trust you for my salvation. But if I give myself fully to you, you're going to do things with my life I don't like. But the reality is God's not going to call a lot of you to do that. And if he did, he would give you a heart that wanted to do that. Delight yourselves in the Lord. He will give you the desire of your heart. Delighting yourselves in the Lord. That might be another way to say, full of the Holy Spirit. And then he puts desires in our hearts and we want to do them because the Spirit's calling us to do it. We want nothing more than that. And for many of us, that would be living the life that we're living now, just full of the Holy Spirit in a way that people say they're just like Jesus. I don't know what we're so afraid of when it comes to Holy Spirit living. We see the excesses in our day, but just because we see excesses in some branches of Christianity doesn't mean we should shut ourselves off to the reality, reality of spirit-filled living. So how do we become spirit-filled people? Again, the first thing is to come to Christ in, in repentance and faith. I think John did a great job leading us to the Lord's Supper and pointing us again to the gospel. If you're here, you don't know Jesus, today could be the day of salvation. You come to Christ, you get the Holy Spirit. Who else gets to say that? What other people in the world can say, the God of the universe lives in me? The Holy Spirit comes to many people with conviction of sin, but for some people he comes and makes a home, a residence in us. Is your heart an address of the Holy Spirit? What does it look like then to be, to be spirit-filled? One of my colleagues compares it to a balloon. I did not bring a balloon. My wife said that'd be really corny. I, I clear all big preaching things by her, and, and so you have to imagine with me. So you blow up the balloon. I think even when you're saved, there's air in the balloon. You have the Holy Spirit. But the reality is you can be fuller of the Holy Spirit. And as you blow into the balloon, if I had a balloon up here, I would say, is this full? I think you would say, yes. And then I blow into it more, and it expands even more. And you would say, yes, it's full. And then you blow into it more, and on like a balloon that eventually reaches a point where it pops, you will never pop. You can continually be more full of the Holy Spirit. One of the things I think heaven will be is a place for the infinite God to continue to pour himself into finite people. He can do that forever without exhausting himself. You will be fuller and fuller and fuller of God, and it doesn't have to start at heaven. It can start now. And I think that's what God intends for our lives but we can never slack here. Uh, the, the great evangelist D.L. Moody was once approached by a man, and the man said to him, Sir, I hear that you're full of the Spirit. Is that true? And he said, Yes, it is true. I'm full of the Spirit, but I leak. I leak. If your kids have ever been to a, a birthday party or something, they get these balloons, they come around and float around your house for a couple weeks, and, and eventually what happens? Ones that even go up to the rafters will eventually begin to leak and they'll eventually be come to come down. Some of you might look back on your life and say, I remember what it was like in college or 10 years ago or three years ago or last month when I felt full of the Holy Spirit. What's happened? Part of that is we leak, we, we let up, and there's no room for leaving up in spirit-filled living. You gotta keep running. 
You can't put it on cruise control or get distracted or sip the salt water of the world. The, the, the Bible does talk about quenching the spirit and grieving the spirit. And these are things we can do that, that let more air out of the balloon. But God can always fill it back up and keep filling it. What does this look like? I think Paul gives us some really good examples. The, the, the reality is there's no five easy step program to walking with the spirit. If somebody comes to you and says that, they're a charlatan and don't listen to them. The reality is living a spirit-filled life, it's relational, it's transformative, it's progressive. It takes time over a lifetime to be walking in step with the spirit. But here's some ideas from this text. First, watch your life. Look at verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Paul told Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely. If you're not watching your life and your doctrine closely, you will not be living a spirit-filled life. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade, used to talk about spiritual breathing. You inhale the good and exhale the bad. And I'm gonna torture this metaphor and mix it a little bit and it will make no sense and I'm okay with that. Like you have to exhale the salt water and inhale the living water. But if you do that literally, you will die of drowning. Don't do that. Bill Bright, exhale the bad. The Puritans talk about it like this way. Mortification, put sin to death. If you've got your favorite little sin hiding in the secret of your heart that you still like to go to because it provides you, you think, some satisfaction, you will not be living a spirit-filled life. Put it to death. And then they spoke of vivification. That means bringing to life the spirit in your life. And there's ways that we can do that. It, how are you with your Bible intake? I almost feel like every sermon I've ever preached can come down to, are you reading your Bible and praying? If you're reading your Bible and you're faithful in prayer, my guess is you're feeling pretty whole, full of the Holy Spirit. If you come to me and you say, I just don't feel full of the Holy Spirit, my first question would be, how much time are you in the word? How much time are you praying? And if you say none, that is not surprising. And you were breathing out the bad. That is, watch what you take in. Watch what you watch. Watch what you listen to. Take captive every thought. The Holy Spirit should be like the guardian of the hearts where Paul says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. The Holy Spirit should be there as a fortress in the front of our minds, in the front of our hearts, saying what can and cannot get through. But if we're gonna continue to just let everything in, then we will not be spirit-filled living. Number two, redeem the time. Verse 16, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Jonathan Edwards was the great theologian of the 18th century. He was a master at this. He wrote a whole essay on redeeming the time. And a couple of things he said was, was just noting, time is short and you can't get it back again once it's gone. I know that sounds so obvious, but if we allow ourselves to basically live Groundhog Day over and over and over, wake up, go through the motion, do the same thing, pretty soon we're drifting, pretty soon we're leaking, and we're not pressing into the things of God. We have to be willing to redeem the time. Seek the Lord's will. Therefore, verse 17, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We think of the will of the Lord as something so grand, so mysterious, that we can never actually figure out what it is. When I was about 19 years old or so, I was in Campus Crusade, and I remember being tortured by this. God, what is your will for my life? Even before then, where should I go to college? And then in college, what should I study? Who should I marry? Where should I move? All these questions that felt like if I misstep here once, my whole life is ruined. I messed it up. I went away from God's will, and now everything is gone. I, the, the New Testament doesn't speak of God's will like that. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4. We ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. What is God's will in your life? It's the same answer for everyone here who calls Christ Lord, your sanctification, which means the process by which the Holy Spirit makes you holy, turns you into the image of Christ. 
And then he goes on, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Again, don't walk in the way of people who don't know God. You were bought with a price. The Holy Spirit's in you. Your heart is a temple. Walk in holiness. That is God's will. And let me tell you, if you walk in God's will according to holiness, you'll be amazed at how clear those other questions in life become. Don't seek substitutes. We've been at this a lot, so I will not go into it more, but verse 18, don't get drunk on wine, be filled with the Spirit. Don't seek substitutes. Number five, if my counting is right, sing to the Lord. Verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Music has a way of almost supernaturally bringing us into the presence of Christ. Are you a worshiper? Are you someone who finds yourself alone in your car, alone in your house, singing to the Lord, making melody in your heart? And praise the Lord that there's better options today than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it was like Sandy Patty or Ray Bolts, and that's all you got. Maybe some Carmen or early DC Talk, which was a huge mistake in the music world. But now there's all kinds of good things that, that can stir your heart. Whatever, if you like bluegrass and folk music, there is Christians who do it. And you can, you can do that and let it stir your heart and stir affections uh, corporately. Look at how he says it, addressing one another. Address one another. When you're out here in the comments, just start singing to the other person. I'm just kidding. You'll be weird. <laughs> but the reality is, this is why we gather together and we cor corporately worship. It's not meant to do it alone. Look, you cannot live the spirit-filled life by yourself. You just can't do it. You need other people in your life who are pressing these things into your heart, who are reminding you, remember what Jesus has done. Steer away from that sin. Finally, live thankful lives. Verse 20. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bitterness, entitlement, and things of the like will sap the spirit from our lives. If you have been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit is inside of you, if when death comes you're in the presence of God, that is enough to be thankful for. And when we live thankful lives of what God has done for us in Christ, we're stirring up the Spirit in our hearts and in our, in our affections. I want to end with just a couple questions. Pretty basic, but you need to be honest with yourself. Are you living a Spirit-filled life? For some of you, that question goes to the roots of salvation. Do, does the Holy Spirit even live inside of you, and how do you know? Are the fruits of the Spirit manifest in your life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. If the Spirit's in your life, you should see those things growing. What is distracting you from living a Spirit-filled life? Are those secret sins of the heart, things that are keeping you, that you keep feeding, things keeping you from the Spirit-filled life? What are things that God might even this morning be calling you away from? Hopefully calling you to himself, but almost always then calling us away from something. Simply, the question I began with, what are you filled with? Let's pray. God, what an amazing promise it is that for those who trust in Jesus Christ, the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, comes to live inside of us, to give us, to make us new creation, to give us new desires, new heart. God, I pray that whatever is blocking people from spirit-filled living this morning, you'll take it away. Lord, if we've met here just in vain and, and, and not to meet with you, not to walk out of here changed, then I pray that you'll convict through your Holy Spirit so that it will lead to change. Praise in Christ's name. Amen.